In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Christ is risen. You know why in our tradition, every time we meet in these holy 50 days, we, we say Christ is risen? It's because for us, the resurrection is the most essential symbol of what God has done for us and how he has transformed our lives and how he has reconciled us to himself. And that's really important for us because we were distant from God. We were removed from him and we needed to be reconciled. We needed to be brought back. We needed our lives to change. One of the most important things in Christianity is the realization that one has sinned. And once we realize that, then the realization that there needs to be repentance. Once we realize that, we take action, we confess, we come back, and we are restored. None of that can happen without the initial realization that we had fallen. For us, falling as humanity came when Adam and Eve sinned. But for us personally, falling now means that we sin personally on a daily basis. It would be great for us to be able to transcend that, to overcome it, to be more powerful. But alone, we will fall, we will sin, because we have a susceptibility to sin. We have a brokenness of our humanity. Um, if, we look at, um, if we look at the example of gravity, whenever we are here, just as we're sitting, there is a force pulling us down. Gravity pulls us down, and that's a constant. We're always under the force of gravity, which means that um, if, if I lose muscle tone, I will fall. If I hold something up, and remove whatever holds it up, it will fall to the ground. Because of the brokenness of our human nature, we have that constant downward force on us, which is our susceptibility to sin. Because our will is weak, because we are inclined towards um, a weakness that is ingrained in the way we make decisions the way we are skewed away from the image of God that we originally created in. That sounds horrible, right? But the reality is, just as I said, there is a constant downward force on us, which is gravity, there is a constant grace as well that holds us up. And that's why at this point, I'm holding this cross and it's at a state of equilibrium. It's not going down, it's not going up, because the force up by my hand is equal to the force down by gravity. Right? So, in our day-to-day -day lives, if we are with God, if we are making the right decisions, if our heart's in the right place, if our will is in the right place, then we're in this place of equilibrium. But what we are also able to do through our relationship with God is continue to rise. Because God's power and his authority is infinitely more than that of Satan. Satan has nothing on him. Because our God is the creator of all things. He is God. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. But when we distance ourselves, from him, we fall. Now the incarnation brought him into our midst. He came among us. He dwelt among us. He's always there. He wanted to be among us to give us an example from within. Um, one of the, the, the expressions you sometimes hear about someone who is quite normal in the way they act is, this person is down to earth, right? 
I thought about it recently. I'm not sure what the origin is, but it, it almost does have a, a scent to it of incarnation. That God, when he came down to earth, dwelt among us and seemed like he was one of us because he took on our humanity and he lived as one of us. And so we were inspired by him. We lived with him. So when he did that, he showed us that in actual fact, our humanity is not beyond repair. It's not broken too much. And as he lived our lives, he gave us greater and greater examples. And then, when he ascended to the cross, when he died, and when he rose, he showed us very clearly that he had overcome even death, the death of sin. And he completely transformed our lives. Our lives were totally different. Our lives now had hope. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15 we read, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, where is your victory? We were, we were tied, we were shackled, we were imprisoned. We, we were bound in sin. And so we were defeated. What hope did we have? Imagine someone born in a prison cell, living as a prison cell, and all you really have to look forward to is to die in that same prison cell. That's what we were as humanity. We had no hope, nothing, we had no hope that anything was going to change. But when our Lord came, died, rose, and freed us, he came and he broke open the door of that cell. And suddenly, we knew we could venture out. We knew we could exit that cell. We knew that we could walk away from it. And that's the hope we have today. And that's why we rejoice in the resurrection. Because through it, we were no longer shackled to sin. Through it, we were no longer slaves. And our Lord said to us that we were no longer slaves, we were children, sons and daughters, with everything that entails. With the son and daughter, there is infinite love, infinite forgiveness, infinite understanding. Look at the story of the prodigal son. When the, young, when, when the young son comes back and the father's rejoicing and they're celebrating and the older son comes and says, I don't understand. I've been with you all this time. You've never had a celebration for me. You've never asked me to gather my friends. You've never even given me a goat to, to, to have a feast. And the father's response was striking. Son, you are always with me and all I have is yours. That is the difference between a son and a servant and a slave. Satan was a ruthless taskmaster. He was the citizen of that country where the prodigal son sat feeding swine, desiring their food and not even able to consume it. Yet at the same time, he had a father who was waiting for him and willing to accept him. And so the resurrection changed the dynamic, dynamic of that relationship and made us realize that there is more to being ourselves and alive in this world. We had something to aspire to, to hope for. That's why we try to be good stewards, faithful stewards, to take the talents and work with them and get five more, to follow our Lord and his footsteps, to be as he was, to live his example, to be his disciples, all of those things. He gives us a model that we can live by. He gives us hope that we can be better. We sometimes become so resolved to being who we are that we just don't try anymore. 
you know, you, you get this, what they call the vicious cycle of poverty, where you, you are born poor, and so you think you can never come out of it, so you live poor, and it becomes worse. Whereas now, we are told, we're not in poverty, we are actually sons and daughters. We are heirs to the kingdom. We are his children. We have his inheritance. He gives us all of that, and at no cost. He doesn't want uh, me to do anything in particular. What he does want of me is to live a certain kind of life. I'm not paying him anything. I'm just called to be faithful, for me, because he wants me to be free. It's like, if we go back to the example of breaking that cell door open, it's like breaking that cell door open, taking me out and saying, you know what, I want you to live here free. I'm not getting anything out of it, but I don't want, to be a, I don't want you to be a slave anymore. I want you to live according to the freedom that I had already given you. The beautiful thing about God is his concept of justice. Deuteronomy 10, we read, He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Now, that's just a stranger. That's the person in need. What about those who are his children? Those who are close to his heart. Those whom he loves and for whom he took flesh, and whom he raised in his resurrection. How much more? You know the expression, charity starts at home. So surely, if he is that way with the stranger, who's out there and distant, how much more love and graciousness and kindness and generosity does he have with us? It's immense. But we just don't tap into it. We don't realize it. We don't make use of it. It's like we, we are the sons and daughters of the king, but we either don't remember it, so we continue to live as beggars on the street, or we just don't think it's important. We don't see the necessity. We don't understand the need. We have so much open to us, so much available to us. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ changed our lives, changed them totally. And that's why St. Paul tells us we must put on the new man. We are going to be in him a new creation. And yet what we do is we keep putting on the old. Never changing, never transcending. Living as the old person while actually having the opportunity to be the new. Why would we do that? Why would we constantly live in a worse state? Continue to live in need and in poverty when we have incredible riches. Riches of spirit and love and heart and forgiveness. Riches that only God can give and no one else. Again, when we look at the poor, Psalm 32 tells us to defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. So when we receive those things, we are then able to do this. It changes us. When we have, we give. Our Lord said to his disciples, freely you have received, freely give. And we have received freely. God doesn't ask anything for us, but for himself, he asks it for us. He doesn't benefit anything when we live strong and confident. He doesn't get anything from us 
being free. What he does is he ensures that our lives change. Yours or mine. How do our lives change? We become more confident and capable. We become stronger. We become more able to be ourselves, to reach our potential. I want us to think back in our lives. And I want us to think how many times we actually have not reached our potential. That we've just done things for the sake of doing them. That we've just done things because that's all we thought we were capable of. And we apply ourselves just a little bit. We do just a little bit more. And by applying ourselves, by doing that little bit more, our lives change totally. We suddenly see something new. We see a new capability. We realize we can live in a very different way. Our view of the world changes. Until, um, until probably a couple of years ago, um, I would read, and I can read what's in front of me here, but it's a little bit blurry. And I struggled with it, continued to read, and then someone suggested, why don't you get your eyes checked? Got my eyes checked and got these smashing glasses, as you can see, and put them on and thought, wow, I, I can actually see. I can actually read clearly. I don't need to squint. I don't need to struggle. It was a new view of life, a totally new perspective. That, in a small way, is what happened to the man born blind and to the woman we spoke about this morning, the Samaritan woman. The man born blind was born in blindness. He had never seen light. He didn't know what it meant. He could possibly have felt the sun on his face, but wouldn't have known what daylight looked like. And the minute our Lord opened his eyes, his life changed. The Samaritan woman lived a life of alienation and marginalization. She was rejected. And yet suddenly, when this traveler expressed interest in her, asked her about herself, offered to give her something of value. Her perspective changed, her narrative changed, her dialogue changed, her thought process changed, she changed. And that's what we expect. That's why God wants us to be different, because we become different for ourselves. Because we end up being the people that he wants us to be. He has created us with so much opportunity. God did not create us to die, but to live. And not just even to live on this earth, in this world, but to live beyond it. He's given us all of that. He's given us that capability that possibility, that strength. He's given us that potential, but we only use a fraction of it. We only use a minute part of what he gives us. And yet, sometimes, even using that minute part, we sense the sweetness of what it is to be with him. Just as a passing sweetness. You know, when we, when we suddenly experience God one day in a situation with people, it feels good. And that's just a fleeting thought or a fleeting experience. Imagine if that was our common state. If that was a, our standard state of being. How we would be. Who we would be. 
Imagine that sense of fleeting joy becoming our consistent experience and existence. What a difference to life. And that's why the church doesn't just celebrate the resurrection on one day a year, the commemoration, but it gives us 50 days between resurrection and Pentecost, and not only that, every Sunday in our calendar is dedicated to the resurrection. Because it is such a monumental turning point for humanity. It keeps reminding us, look, this is where you were, this is where you are now. This is who you were, this is who you are now. This is where you could have ended up, this is what potential you have to be and where you have to go now. You are different, you are a new creation. You died on that cross, you were buried in that tomb, and in Christ, you were risen. He raised us. That's why the greeting we said at the beginning, Christ is risen, it's not, not just a historical thing. We're not celebrating it because Christ rose 2,000 years ago. We're saying Christ is risen because it is a present significant experience. Christ is risen today. He continues to be risen. His, his state doesn't change. Our life in Him doesn't change. It continues to be in a state of victory and a state of strength, power, and life. I suppose it comes down to one thing, though. Do we really believe it? Or do we just celebrate this thing, this phenomenon? Hebrews 11.1 1 is very clear. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's what it comes down to. Is our faith strong? Do we have that faith? What is the evidence? The evidence is that humanity changed. We keep saying, um, why is God different in the Old Testament? Why, he's, why is he different in the New Testament? Why was he harsh and ruthless in the Old Testament? Why is he gentle and kind in the New Testament? God didn't change. We did. Our progress is almost um, in three stages. The beginning stage as we were in the Old Testament. Young, reckless, angry. That sound like any adolescence, you know? It was that state. It was that state of lack of experience and being unsure and wanting things and, and, and being aggressive. And so God was saying to us, just calm down. Just calm down. You're trying to harness this energy to calm people down to let them develop and mature. And then comes the incarnation in the fullness of time. What does the fullness of time mean? When God was ready, because we were ready. In the fullness of time, he came. And he said to us, okay, this is time now for the second stage. A stage of love and forgiveness, graciousness, development, newness, reconciliation. A new stage of maturity. A new stage of development. A new stage for a very new life. And that was beautiful. Because that's what we're living in now. And that's where we see the differences. He calls us to that new way of life. In preparation for stage three. 
which is the fullness of life. Going from the, the juvenile, underdeveloped stage into the developing, mature, gracious, free stage, and then moving in to the fullness of our existence, being exactly who he wanted us to be. No longer young and inexperienced and angry, not struggling, but still moving ahead, but going into that fullness of experience where I have developed once again into living with him forever as his image and his likeness, where there is no longer hunger or thirst or disease. There's no longer a, 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 a connection to or an attraction to or a susceptibility to sin. There's no more temptation. There is a fullness of the experience of God without the conflict. Every day when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. It means, Lord, your kingdom that we are going to live eternally, let it come today. Let us have just a, a brief taste or experience of it. Let us, let us try to live with it. Show us what it is. Even in our very limited way. Even at this time when we can experience it in, in, a, in a limited context. Even when we are surrounded by the frailty of our humanity, yet we are still able to experience some of it. Because we yearn for it. Because we want it. We desire it. Because we look forward to the fullness of time when we can be in that state forever. And that is our desire. That's the hope that comes in the resurrection. That is the transformative power of this resurrection. Changing our state. Changing the way we feel about ourselves and about our lives. Changing the perception we have of what we are capable of. I can look in the mirror and see myself as only broken and so live as only broken. Or I can look at myself in the image of Christ and see the beauty and the grace and say, you know what, this is what I'm capable of. His humanity showed me what I as a human can do. I can be loving and forgiving and gracious and kind. I can be joyful. I can help people. I can be generous. I can live a very different life. I can experience life differently. And that then becomes what we aim for, what we aspire to. It's easy for us to be broken down. One of the um, difficulties of, of the societies we live in now, as many of you will know, is that perception is very important to us. And sometimes when people give us the perception of ourselves that we will only fail, that's all we aspire to. You know, there is this thing about young people being irresponsible and uh, having a lack of sense of achievement and no drive and the cause of all the problems we have. And if we keep instilling that image onto young people, whoever they are, that's how they live. But once we encourage and we give hope they will suddenly think they can achieve better. This is what the resurrection did to us. It said to us, although you live this life, and although you die in sin and you fall, there is a newness, there is a hope. There is life out of the empty tomb. And there is a way of living that guarantees us 
continuing on God's path until we are ready to enter into his kingdom. Guarantees us that he will be there guiding us as we follow him. And in the fullness of time, when it is our time, he will enter us into that glory. So we pray that God gives us that glory, that his kingdom may come into our hearts today. Reaffirm the possibility of life that we can live. Prepare us for the fullness of life that he has promised and give us confidence that as he is risen, we can only rise also, not only from the death of sin in this world, but we rise eternally into his kingdom. And glory be to God forever. We should take a moment to reflect on that and we'll take any questions if you have them. Questions or comments? There's one back there. Could we could you take the microphone down to him, please? Thank you. Just put your hand up. Thank you. Just a comment. I just want to say thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know what? If you listen to what I said, it was probably eighty percent scripture, so I can't really take much credit. <laughs> so let me ask what's your name? My name is Nathan, and um, so I guess just a response is you had a lot of reflection. There was scripture, but you had a lot of your own personal insight. And so, so can I ask you, I mean, just not to put you on the spot, but what touched you, not in what I said, but in the message? What particular things may have been a, a new perspective for you? I would say like a refocus. Um, a personal connection is uh, I volunteered for a summer where I went out and taught, basically. I just traveled, it was through a diocesan program. I'm actually not even a Coptic Orthodox, I'm Catholic. Oh no, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I, no. I, I picked that up. <laughs> um, but our beliefs are essentially the same, so I wanted to come hear what you had to say. Anyway, um, so I volunteered for a summer, and you were talking about the perspective of, that change of perspective, how you would live differently. And I thought of, I always think about that summer because it was almost like, I chose to do it, but it was almost like a job where I was the face of Christ to many others. And so you live differently when you have that kind of expectation of yourself and presentation towards others. And I always think back to that as, as the best times in my life probably because of that kind of personal challenge, I guess, each day. And um, that's kind of like what, I would want to aspire to be, I would want to aspire to be that way on a day-to-day -day basis and why I can't do that per se in my normal life as opposed to when I was choosing to volunteer in that way. So I was just kind of really reflecting on that and the different perspective. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Questions or comments? Wow, tough crowd. <laughs> uh, down here, please. Um, I know as, as youth, we go through hard times because of the world and the technology and how it's time consuming. Um, how can your grace advise us to um, control our timing with technology or like how to create a balanced system? Because everything is related to technology, whether it's school, it's work, everything is connected somehow to the phone or tablet or laptop, so. Can I comment on the way you asked the question? Sure. You speak, and this is true of all of us, you speak as someone who is oppressed by technology, whereas it's actually in our hands. We give it that authority over us. I can very easily switch off my phone, or switch off my computer, or decide not to look at my social media, but I feel compelled to. 
That's where it starts. It starts with prioritizing my time, and it starts with realizing once again where the power, where the authority lies. I hold the authority. But we do let our technology and our social media and, and our communications generally dictate what we do. Um, so, this is something which annoys me a little bit. Um, if I'm sitting with someone, I will make a point that if someone has made an appointment to see me, and if that person has come to see me personally, that person has priority. So I will not pull my telephone out of my, my phone stays in my pocket. I won't pull it out during that time. And yet I will be sitting down with somebody in that situation and a message will come. Now we're talking about someone, teenager, 20s, 30s, and they will have to pull the phone out of their bag or out of their pocket and see who it is. Now at that stage, you know, I can understand whether you're you know, a, a practitioner on call in whatever field you're in, whether you have a family emergency that you're waiting for word on, I can understand that. But short of that, what is the priority of, of having to look at it there and then? Why the urgency? We need to take control back. And I think that's the starting point. And then we need to prioritize and manage our time. So again, um, everything now, so at one stage, um, back in the dark ages, to take a phone call, you'd have to be near a physical phone. You remember those things that were on homes where you have to pick up and just put it to your ear and stuff? You know, no one has those anymore, right? I can't, to be honest, I can't remember the last time I called a landline. Now, we all use each other's mobile phone numbers. And then there was this great thing where you could leave a message on the landline. Now, our phones are in our hand all the time, and we feel that we must respond to everything immediately. Actually, no, you don't. Give yourself room to breathe. Again, unless it's related to your occupation, or an emergency, or a particular exception, but the exception cannot become the rule. There is so much we can do with our time. When I want time alone, I dedicate time alone. And I must say, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really impressed because I'm sitting here with, with, with you and I haven't seen, or at least to my knowledge, a single one of you pull your phone out of your pocket. Which, you know, for, for half an hour is pretty good going. But what that means is you've prioritized that time. And it wasn't for me, it was because we're sharing God's word. And so you prioritized it to receive a message that you would live by. And that's why it's important. You need to prioritize that for yourselves. I don't need to be standing here for you to take a half hour breather from your communications. You can set that rule for yourself on a daily basis. Ring fence some time. Dedicate some time that is just for your spiritual growth and for your spiritual message. And make that totally dedicated. Anyone else? Yes, please. Thank you, Sayedna, for uh, the awesome message. Uh, question for you. Your grace spoke about the two forces that act on us, the corrupted nature that, nature that tends to pull us down and then the grace of God that pulls us up. How can we experience the grace of God in a more tangible way in our lives? I think we experience it every time we are able to face temptation and overcome it. That's God's grace. Because left to ourselves, we will probably fall. The fact that I can overcome temptation or the fact that I can 
have a spiritual exercise that I commit to, or the fact that I can be kind and loving and gracious, the fact that I can bite my tongue when I want to be critical or offensive, but I'm, but I'm polite, the fact that uh, I can respond to anger and aggression with love and forgiveness, they're all very tangible. The fact that we see our brothers and sisters in Egypt until today being targeted and sometimes until today, the 21st century, losing their lives for their faith and yet not retaliating, not responding in kind, but in fact being loving and forgiving, that is clearly God's grace. That could be nothing else. And those are, we, we think they're all just, okay, so what? But actually that is God's grace. Because if I were to go with my broken, fallen human nature, I would respond to anger with anger and violence with violence. But the fact that I don't means I'm living God's grace and it's making me, making me into a different and more empowered person. So we actually use God's grace a lot more than we, more than we think. Yes. Uh, hello, Your Grace. Um, it's nice to see you again. And uh, I don't think the, the last time I saw you was uh, some time ago. So I, first, I just wanted to say, um, you know, congratulations on your enthronement um, in uh, in uh, England. And it, it comes kind of the news came to me with kind of bittersweet. On the one hand, you know, it's a uh, it's a great uh, indication of the development of the church, you know, abroad here in, in America and in, in the UK. Um, and on the other hand, it may preclude your grace from kind of other assignments, so. Um, well, I'm but still here, believe me. <laughs> but but I mean, just, just, to, let, just to, to, to put your mind at ease a little bit. Um, so just so you know, being a diocesan bishop means that, and I, people are thinking, but how can you, how can you not travel as much? Actually, it doesn't feel like that at all. It just feels like a new stage of life where I now have to focus a little bit more, and it comes with great joy. But what I also don't want to do is to lose my relationship with you, because we have had a bond and relationship for almost 20 years. I've seen you grow up and develop. I've seen you change, and I've seen such stages of your lives that I'm not willing to give away. And so what I'm actually doing is I am consciously decreasing my travels, but I'm not totally cutting them out, which means that I will still be coming and still seeing people, um, maybe not as frequently, but I will certainly be here to continue this journey that we started together. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll comment about um, something you said a little earlier. You cited two passages from the Old Testament, uh, one from Deuteronomy and one from uh, one from the Psalms, and, and, and I, I, I don't recall the details, but what struck me was, you know, you emphasized um, the, the, you know, the, the watching out for the neighbor or for, you know, the weak or something along those lines. And, and it's interesting because, you know, the, 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 the balance of what you were talking about was, you know, more resurrection and more New Testament. And, and so you cited Old Testament you know, passages that, that I hear and you, you hear the spirit of in the New Testament all the time. You, you don't really in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, and then you, you kind of characterize the Old Testament as, you know, the juvenile kind of person. Um, so I just, um, I kind of contrast that. It, it's interesting to see that, you know, spirituality of the New Testament in the Old Testament, and certainly it was there, but you, you just kind of, you don't see it as much as in the New Testament. So that's just kind of a comment. And I think it's indicative of how God still challenges us. When you have a child who's growing up, you don't ever not try to get them to aspire to greater things, but you have a limited expectation, but you still challenge them. And so he was challenging them to very basic things like, like provide for the needy. But then, of course, you know, as we said, and as you reaffirmed, God doesn't change but we've been changing and developing, and so the message becomes greater. And, and so my question then is, um, and um, you know, your, your grace has been coming here for 20 years and, and so on and so forth, and 
you know, the church has grown and the, the church is now in a different state than it was 20 years ago and 30 years ago when kind of the first generation were the very young people. And, um, and, and now, you know, thankfully, th you know, thanking God and God willing, you know, the church is um, composed of many people who were born and raised here, or at least raised here, and you find, you know, mature, adult, um, faithful among the church here. And, and so I just wanted to get your take on, just comments on maybe what you remembered in, in the past about the composition of the church and, you know, what you think about your, the, the, you know, kind of the vision of the future of the church where, just like in Egypt, you have, you have members of all ages and maturities and so on, you know, now we're getting to that point here and, you know, I, 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 um, what, what are, what are, what's your kind of vision? How do you envision the church to be in the composition of the church? And it, it's a broad question, but uh, just some comments from you. I think looking at this church right here where we are and looking at the composition and makeup, look at this diversity. This is the church today. You've got people who are obviously born here. You've got people who may have been born in Egypt or in other places. You know, there are lots of people who, whose parents were working in the Gulf and they were born in the Gulf and they come to, to the West, whether it be here or the United Kingdom or anywhere else. Um, you have people who were born in Egypt and migrated with their families. You have people who are starting new families and, that, and, and will have children moving forward. So there is a, a huge broadening of the demographic. And I think that's very natural. Um, I think whereas we had issues of language and culture being young and old, it's not going to be young and old anymore because there are people who um, were born here who are now in their 40s and 50s who have this concept of language and culture because this will be their first language and culture. Um, Likewise, there, there may have been challenges of integration, whereas now the people integrating are not those who need English, but those who come with Arabic as their first language, because they're integrating into an existing system. Um, I've even had conversations where there is almost an exception taken to the concept of serving in the lands of immigration. Because for some people, these are no longer lands of immigration. These are their indigenous homes. They've been brought up in these countries. They live here. And I think that is a constantly adapting relationship. Don't forget that um, while we can see the flaws in many of the things that we experience, we don't realize that our community outside of Egypt is very young. We're talking about 50 years. It, well, yeah, we're talking about 50 years. So 50 years for a church that was a domestic indigenous church to suddenly transition out and become a church in new lands with new cultures and new experiences and new languages and try to incorporate that. And, and I must say, I think that while we still have work to do, and we'll always have work to do, because you know, as, as we transition to meet the needs of your generation, we're going to be looking at your kids' generation and then their kids' generation. And it's a constantly ongoing, uh, developing situation. Um, so we see that changing and we see the response to that. As I said, although there is still more to do, I think a lot has been done. And I think we will see the acceleration over the next maybe 10, 15 years being much greater than that over the last 20 years. Because we have more scope, we have more experience. Um, I just, one of the stops I had before coming here was a meeting of the, um, the bishops, our bishops of North America. And they invited myself from from England and His Grace Amber Surreal from Australia to attend. Because when we look at the cultural makeup of England, for instance, I feel much closer in terms of experience. 
and culture to North America and Australia than I do to the rest of Europe. It's a very different makeup. Um, so we sat there and we spoke about lots of things that you wouldn't even imagine. Things about um, developing rituals, adapting rituals, changing things that you couldn't imagine bishops were talking about because you would think that we're trying to hold on to the past. But in actual fact, we are trying to transition holding on to the ritual and the meaning of the ritual and the theology of the ritual, but making it more relevant as we move on. And that's a real challenge because we have, we have gems that we've received. I'm going to use a metaphor and I hope it works, but um, for some beautiful gems, um, ladies help me out if I get stuck here, right? Some of them are timeless and they look as beautiful today as they did in the past and the fact that they look more antiquated means they're even more precious. Some can be remounted into a new setting to bring forth their beauty and some maybe need to be put into a vault as a precious commodity that we, that we still hold on to but that don't need to be presented in the same way. And now, I'm not talking about our theology because our theology doesn't change, but our rituals and our prayers and the way we live, I think we have a lot of things that are still beautiful as they are, but some things that need to be remounted. And just because, because in a new setting, they will end up looking much more beautiful to the contemporary eye that doesn't understand them as they were set. So I do think we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but it's exciting work. It's very challenging work. And the problem is that with much of this, uh, not much, okay, much is too extreme. With a lot of this, some of this, there is no middle ground. And that's the difficulty. Um, so, for instance, and I don't want to open a conversation about this, I'm just going to use it as an example, something like hymnology. You know, you have people who love the hymnology the way it is, being in Coptic, it's steeped in tradition, it's expressive and beautiful, and some who just don't feel it, and who want a more contemporary form of worship, not liturgically, but I mean in different settings of Bible studies or youth meetings. Um, now, the middle ground we have is we have a scope where we use the liturgical traditional worship here in liturgical um, celebrations, and then we use the contemporary worship in more contemporary settings. That's fine. But if we come to talk about, let's say, Holy Week, Holy Week, and, and the love of Holy Week as it is, with the hymnology, with the Psalms, all the beauty, to some people just not being able to feel it. Now, and I'm not saying one way or another what we should do, but I am saying, do we hold on to tradition at the exclusion of some, or do we adapt and develop it at the exclusion of others who don't want it developed? And, and that's a difficult decision to make. And so I think what I would hope that we end up, that we end up finding over time is we have a broad spectrum of ministries that suit everyone. The core ministries that don't change stay the way they are, but then, and as we do now, you will have longer liturgies and shorter liturgies, you will have traditional liturgies with Coptic and Arabic, you'll have liturgies just in English, and I think that's a good model where you, we don't impose anything on anyone, but you have a diversity where it's possible so people slot into what they feel because it's important for us to also feel our prayers and engage with them. Very long answer, I'm sorry. That, that, that's great, and I, I certainly believe in the, the, uh, the diversity to have a little bit for everybody, you know, so th that's great. Um, and, and I do believe in education and 
part of the problem is that somebody who, who isn't feeling it, it may be, I'm not saying it 100%, but you know, it may be part or big part of a lack of understanding and education. So that, that's an area of growth or an area of work, you know. And, and I guess my last question is, you know, how can I, how can we get involved in that project that you're talking about at that, you know, the bishop's level? How can we get involved in it? <laughs> too late for uh, that. Too late for that one. <laughs> no, no, you're fine? Okay, I think we, uh, you might have a way out. <laughs> Um, I, I think, um, I think um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a process, and I think we're on the first stage of the process. And I do feel that we will need people to be on board at different stages. So watch the space. If you have any suggestions, share them. I mean, you have bishops here in North America. Um, share your suggestions and it comes part of the conversation. Um, and I'm sure, uh, I, you know, I would hope that when the time comes, they'd be looking for input as well, in which case they will reach out as well. You have a question, sir? Um, the first, uh, I want to thank you. Um, second, uh, I, was, I just think about the point that you mentioned, talking about uh, Jesus uh, taking out of humanity and uh, Relating this to the point of being at the, at the equilibrium, mm -hmm. um, I when I think about it is how how can I apply this to myself as a person living the the life of Christ? Also, when when we talk to people like about being able to like for for example, Jesus Jesus was at, was at the equilibrium. For keeping him, for keeping himself from sinning or falling down, how can we apply this to ourselves? Also, how can I overcome sin? How can I apply the equation to be able to, you know, just put myself, pull myself up, and not going down? Also, how can I apply? Jesus took our humanity and lived in it. So how can I apply love and forgiveness in my life as Jesus did it? Yet He's a God, but. How can I do it as a human since okay. he did? Thank you. So just to clarify first, Christ did not have to struggle with sin because as being fully God, he didn't sin. So although he took our humanity, as, as we read in the scriptures and in even liturgy, he resembled us in all things but sin alone. So there wasn't the internal struggle in him for sin that there is for us. What he did is he provided the ideal model of the life of purity and faithfulness that we aspire to. So the first thing is I take him as an example and I try to aspire to him. That equilibrium that we were talking about comes from me being able to call on God's grace to overcome the temptation. So to learn to pray when I'm tempted, to call upon him. Uh, it, it's like when you get into an emergency, you pick up the phone, you dial emergency services, right? When you have a problem, pick up your phone, you'll call someone who's close to you. When we start to fall into temptation, call upon him in prayer. That's really important. That in itself will change the dynamic. That in itself will change what's happening. Because it will instantly make me feel that I have someone to go to. And it will instantly distract me from the sin itself. So how do I live the example in my life? It's very simple. In some cases. And that is, when someone wrongs me, I just, I need to forgive. It's the bottom line. No one says that forgiveness is a simple thing to do but it is the right thing to do. And so I see examples in our Lord himself, but I also see examples, so he was betrayed by Judas, he was denied by Peter, he was left alone by all the disciples, he was scorned by the criminals crucified with him, all of that. But at a more even practical level, 
we see it, and I made mention of this in passing, of the recent martyrdoms of people in Egypt. We see a great strength in their witness, but we also see a great strength in the forgiveness of their families. So it's, it's possible, it's doable, it's not impossible. It's not something we just read in scripture. It's something we've seen with our eyes in our current generation. It's not just something we heard about in the third, fourth, or fifth centuries when Diocletian or you know, others in the seventh century when there was so much persecution. But we see it today and it actually happens. So it's those small things that we apply to our lives in my workplace, in my family, in my home, with people I know, with people I love, with people who hate me. It's those, the interactions at that level, small ones, very small interactions that make me feel that I can apply this. Talking about forgiveness as a point, um, looking at it, I myself tell myself, um, it, Jesus was able to do this because he's a God, yet he, he lived in our humanity, he took our humanity and he lived it, but he was able to do it as because he's a God. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it. I think many other people would say the same thing. Oh, I cannot forgive as much as, as Jesus did because he's a God. I'm not a God. Now, when I look at this point, for, for example, do I, do I consider myself as a human and Jesus lived in my humanity so I should be able to do it even though I, there is something holding me from not doing it? Or like how, how okay, should I look so, at it? So let me respond to that. Sorry, your name? Risk. Risk. Okay, so you're absolutely right in that we're not God. But God is not expecting you to forgive people as you are being crucified as a criminal and being mocked and being uh, betrayed by all of the people who followed you and being scorned by a whole society. He's asking you to, to forgive at a much smaller level because he knows what we're capable of. Do you understand that point? Yeah, I get it. The second thing is, if you look at the 21 who died in Libya, they're not God. Their families aren't God. When you look at people who lost children and wives in, in Cairo in the cathedral bombing, they're not God. When you look at people who, you know, a six-year-old who, who lost her brother and, and her family, and she still witnessed her faith, she's not God. So we have... We thank God that we have living examples among us that we need to live by. Those situations should not make us angry. They should give us a desire to be the same. But I must say as well, you say you're not God so you can't do it, right? The 21 who went to Libya didn't go as missionaries. They went to work. They didn't think they were going to be making a point. They didn't think they were going to be known all over the world. But at the right time, they were given the right grace to be able to overcome. So God gives us grace according to the trial we are in. You, know, you put yourself and you say, how can I possibly forgive someone who just killed my father, mother, sister, brother? And I thank God that we don't need to worry about that today. But I'm also sure that if the time came, the grace we have would allow us to do that. So we should never ever forget that there is one very important ingredient, and that is God's grace. Because he would never ever let us go through something like that alone. I say, no, um, my question is kind of a two-parter. The first one, uh, it kind of relates to like the last 20, 30 years. Is it, is it right to say that the church is adjusting to the new age without indicating that um, for ch the church is changing? Um, I, I don't even mind the fact that the church is changing. Adjusting, changing, the, the church needs to be adaptable. Its message must be the same, but its delivery can be adaptable. There's nothing wrong with delivery changing. Um, in actual fact, when our Lord spoke against the scribes and the Pharisees, his point was, you're rigid, 
you're not changing, you're putting the law above the people. Whereas his take was, make it bearable. And so, and I've said this time and time again, I think the church is a living, breathing body of Christ. And so it needs to continue to be adaptable. The things we don't change are our understanding of Christ, the theology that becomes the, the, the underpinning of everything. But short of that, the delivery of that message must be relevant. So if I have the most beautiful message in the world, but I come here today and I give it to you in German, right? and you don't speak German, what, what, what significance did it have? Makes no sense. And so we have beauty, but it must be delivered. It must be receptive. It must be receivable. Otherwise, it makes no difference. Otherwise, it becomes very grand opera, but doesn't communicate anything. Um, the second part. Um I just, I was wondering if the Coptic Church is, in your eyes, is doing anything to advocate for mental health, um, like currently, because obviously it's, it's very much alive and we see it every day, but does the Coptic Church necessarily advocate for it as, as other um, like Christian churches do? Um, I, I, I would like to think that we do in some places. Don't forget that every church is, is a product of its environment as well. Um, and our church, being our church, is still 90% in Egypt. Um, while there is greater awareness of mental health issues in Egypt at the moment, I don't think it is where it is here in the West. Certainly not. I mean, here in the West, we've developed in this leaps and bounds over the past 10 years, for instance. Um, so I do think where we are here, and because of people like yourself who ask this question, you obviously have an awareness. And it's up to you, I think, to flag it up to the church and say, are we doing this and are we doing that? Because that is how we communicate. Um, in England, for instance, we, we do take it very seriously. I'm in the process of setting up an initiative that discusses just mental health. We have lots of physicians in England. The vast majority of our community is physicians. So we have lots of psychiatrists. But we don't have, we have lots of psychiatrists and a few counselors. We don't have psychologists or clinical psychologists. Um, but I very much believe in the fact that we need to provide those services. Um, and we need to be sensitive to them. And I think that is an ongoing development. Um, I would like us to, to be doing more, and I think we will continue to do more, but it does come from awareness from people like yourself and response from us. You know us? I think that is time. So as you know, when I put my hand up like this, what does it mean? It means give me five points you're going to leave with. No right or wrong answers. One. Come on, come on, come on, one. Come on, quick, quick, quick. Sorry? Christ is risen. Okay, I, I'll take that as a, but that's not even one. But I'll take that as an under, underpinning. Come on, one. Give me a point. Yes, you. Any point, anything. It doesn't have to be very intelligent or profound. It just, the first thing comes into your head. I'm not saying the first thing comes into your head is not going to be intelligent or profound, by the way. One. Sorry? Diversity in the church. Thank you, too, yes. An urban tab of God's grace, thank you. Three. Look at your inner beauty based on God's image and likeness in us, not just the brokenness of who we are, thank you. Four. There's always God's grace pushing us up while the broken family pushes us down. Christ showed us our potential. I need one more because I was going to say something smart anyway. So I need one more from you. Last one. Give me a point. No, no, don't look around you. Yes. Christ's message of resurrection is relevant today. 
Christ's message of resurrection is relevant today, he saved you, but do you have a point anyway? It was the same one. No, just anything. First thing comes to your mind. What, what is, the reason I do this is I want each and every one of you to leave here with something. So what's the one point you'll leave with? Perfect. Must be looking onto Christ and trying to imitate him. Thank you. Wonderful. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Yedna for this uh, beautiful uh, couple of days that uh, we spent with his grace. It has been a pleasure having his grace with us. We enjoyed his presence and we always love that his grace come and bless us. We thank him on behalf of all of you. May God bless his uh, service and his ministry. And he always come and visit us and uh, we enjoy his presence and learn from him. Thank you, Sayyid. Thank you. Well, I know it seems a lot longer than it really is, but it's actually been 24 hours, believe it or not. <laughs> I know I give the impression that it's a lot longer, so I'm sorry, but, uh, but it, has, it has been wonderful to be here with you. And as I said, I look forward to seeing you more often. Uh, am I coming? Probably not soon, but I will be coming back. Um, as I said, so if you ever want to know where I am in particular times, bishopangelos.org actually has my, my international youth ministry program for the year. So that, so it, it has our Coptic youth mission um, engagements in the UK, but it also has my international youth ministry program for the year as well. So if you are state hoppers, you can always welcome wherever I am. Let's pray. <laughs> O King of Peace, grant us your peace, bestow upon us your peace, and forgive us our sins. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the majesty, and the blessings. Hear us, Lord, and we pray together, saying thankfully, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So before I go, I'd like us to take a photograph. Last